the people running the forums and looks after all of our IT itself. So if there is a, uh, a cyber security issue at the Open Group, if there's a breach, it's all Dave's fault. <laughs> and um, of course it's nothing to do with me. Um, believe that, you believe anything. So Dave, come on up. Thank Please you, give Alan. a big warm Open Group welcome. Dave will introduce the, um, the panelists. Yeah, on that last point, I was watching the, the four things, and I thought, 75% is a passing grade, right? <laughs> so, so Alan, the VP of security, and I will be talking to you later about assessments and things like that. So anyway, you know, we heard earlier from the great presentations from, from, uh, from Bruce and, and Dan and others about um, how governments are starting to take an interest in, in cybersecurity. And of course, governments have an obligation to protect their citizens. So, what we're going to hear about today on this panel will be three initiatives that the, that the U.S. government is undertaking to develop uh, cybersecurity guidelines, particularly in the area of um, supply chain risk management efforts. And their efforts focus on the integrity of hardware, software that are being incorporated both through procurement into government systems, but also more importantly, you've heard several times this morning about how those policies and uh, frameworks are being extended to protect the critical infrastructure. So we're going to talk about those. Um, I want to introduce our three panels and invite them to come on up. So first, uh, Don Davidson. Oh, here he is. So Don is the uh, chief uh, for lifecycle risk management in the uh, uh, office of the uh, deputy CIO for cybersecurity. And Don, uh, in addition to having what, 40 odd years of service in the, uh, in the DOD is actually a co-lead in the uh, outreach efforts and the harmonization efforts of the Open Trusted Technology Forum. Uh, second, I'd like to do, introduce uh, Angela Smith, who's the Senior Technical Advisor in GSA's Office of Government-Wide Policy, and you're helping to lead the uh, planning to strengthen those cybersecurity practices. In principles in GSA, I'm sure there's a, a strong you know, procurement and, and regulation flavor, policy flavor there. Um, and finally, uh, Matt Scholl, from, uh, from, uh, who's the Deputy Division Chief of NIST, the, which is the U.S. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. And uh, you promote the use of cybersecurity standards as befits a standards organization. So thank you all for, uh, for participating. Um, I'm going to just ask everybody to spend, take, you know, three or four minutes to talk about what the efforts of your, of your groups are. and. Uh, then we'll go into some questions. We'll have, I've got a few that uh, we've got that have come out, but uh, then we'll be, as usual, taking some from the floor. I'll remind everybody, if you have questions for our panelists, write them down on cards, and I believe my colleague, uh, Jim Hightower, will again be uh, asking the questions. Great. Uh, first of all, the prerequisite for being on this uh, panel was the great smile. If you didn't see the four pictures, they had to choose four people, three govies with big smiles in order to do this for public-private. So. Not the norm for government pictures. For <laughs> um, so those that know me, I've been doing this stuff for way too long. Um, I really enjoy the work. I, I think the public-private piece that the government engages in is, is critical work, um, and we don't do it as well as we should. Um, so I'm kind of passionate about it, um, and I, I think that helps. Um, I, I was brought into the CIO because I had a long supply chain risk management background in DOD how to use IT um, to improve our supply chain processes inside DOD. And Mitch Komaroff, my boss, you know, approached me what is now about six years ago and said, can you bring that supply chain experience so that we can look at the IT products that we're bringing into our enterprise? Um, and how do I work with industry to improve the integrity of those products? And one of the lanes we've worked on is, is through the open group uh, and through the ISO community, develop better commercial standards uh, with commercial industry. You know, wh what can they do to raise the bar? Um, what I'm going to talk about today primarily is Don Davidson opinion is not officially a DOD position in many of these, ca in many of these situations. Um, when we tend to write the standards and regulate from the government perspective, we often get it wrong. Uh, and we'd much rather see industry float the boat and have standards that they agree to um, that are commercially acceptable global sourcing standards. So I don't write very unique standards for the government that makes it more difficult for us to use COTS products. Because we gain an advantage 
when I use commercial off-the-shelf products that are, that are manufactured um, at a cheaper rate, uh, usually it can embrace innovation in a faster manner. manner. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that takes me down the CIO route of getting the best IT as quickly as I can that does not always include the cybersecurity that we'd like to see. So how do we then blend those two together so I have a, a role for the CIO and the role for CISO that actually manages the risk in that community? And that's where I've spent the bulk of my time, I'd say in the first half, half of my time, the three years. Uh, since then, I've not been able to spend as much time in this, in this space. Um, because we've been more focused on DOD internal and U.S. government internal. And I think you'll hear some conversations from my, from my partners in this space for where we need to do better due diligence. We need to do better uh, contracting and articulate our requirements better. Thank you, Don. Angela? Uh, uh, thank you for um, inviting me here today. I think, you know, these type of forums are so important to the work that the government does. And uh, I'll be speaking to it, I think, a little bit later. Uh, you know, we're not in this game alone. We're here to serve the, uh, the citizenry, the, um, our partners in the industry, academia. So we're all, in, we're all in the same game, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. So uh, you, I think you'll hear that theme um, from all three of us that, uh, you know, we're not here to impose things. This isn't about compliance. This is about how do we make this work for all of us so that our security posture is a whole lot better. While at the same time, we're kind of looking at those issues where we're, you know, we're not ramping up the cost and we're not driving down innovation and we're still recognizing that we have to work in a, in a global world. So um, a little bit about GSA, I imagine um, a portion of you are probably familiar with the General Services Administration. We do support the um, whole of government in terms of kind of providing those general services. And you may have heard of the Public Building Service, where kind of the federal um, landlord and uh, own a good portion of the federal buildings. Um, and then we have the Federal Acquisition Service, uh, which clearly does federal acquisitions uh, and supports all the agencies and their acquisition needs. Um, we also have a couple other offices, the um, Offices and Services Innovative Technologies, which runs USA.gov. Uh, and they also run the, um, you may have heard of it, FedRAMP for cloud computing, um, often get in involved in a lot of the incubation of um, kind of new solutions um, that, you know, trying to figure out how best to make them work uh, across the federal government. Um, one of those examples is connect.gov, which is uh, around how do we do identity credentials better and cheaper and more efficiently and consistently uh, to serve our citizenry in terms of um, accessing government information and, and uh, services. My organization, Office of Government Policy, clearly we don't do policy for all of, op you know, all of government. Ours is really focused on the policy areas that are um, related to general services, and that uh, covers um, fleet, um, travel, real property, acquisitions, IT, uh, and a couple other little things like um, some aviation policy, oddly enough. Um, so without us even necessarily knowing it, we're, we've found ourselves very front and center in a lot of the conversation that's going on today around supply chain, around cyber, how to manage risk, and, uh, and are trying to figure out, you know, in the area, for example, fleet, we know that connected cars are coming, so, you know, how do we kind of look at that from a policy perspective and not do those um, impeding reg regulations for evolving areas when, you know, we're all trying to figure it out at the same time. So I, I think um, uh, for OGP, um, we have a significant footprint in the area of identity and access management, uh, run the Federal Bridge Policy Authority. Um, we have a testing program for approved products and um, services list uh, for those um, ID management programs. We also run the .gov registrar for all of the uh, .gov domains, US, um, all of US government, federal, state, local, tribal, territorial. Uh, and um, one of the things I, I'm really personally excited about and it's very applicable for here is we're standing up a, a business due diligence information service uh, to address some of those things we heard earlier uh, that the, our insurance policy uh, colleagues uh, talked about um, on kind of how do we identify what those risk, risk indicators are um, and make better risk informed decisions. And with that, I think I segue to uh, definitely piggybacking off the risk management framework that NIST is putting together. Matt, what's, what's, what's NIST doing in this space? Is this thing on? It is. Could be. Oh. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to talk about some of the work that we're doing, not just individually, but jointly um, as uh, agencies across the U.S. government. Um, I'm from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, we are an institute that is national 
and that focuses on standards and technology. There's a shocker, huh? Um, so that being said, we are mostly technology focused, working in standards and standards bodies as well, not necessarily policy focused. Um, NIST serves, uh, especially in cybersecurity, kind of two roles when we look at these things. First and foremost, um, we have responsibilities through many different uh, drivers to provide what we call our internal government corporate standards. So the standards and guidelines that government follows to secure government systems um, are developed uh, in a interagency and external collaboration, but by NIST. These come out in a series of fancy government acronym documents that we call special publications or SP 800 series documents. We also write the standards, the corporate standards, US government corporate standards for non-national security systems that come out in federal information processing standards. We have just a few of those, mostly focused in the areas of cryptography and encryption, where we are very clear and very explicit in the types and mechanisms of encryption that is acceptable for use by the US government. And then we have a test and conformance program that's external, using external commercial laboratories so that external commercial providers can bring in their product that we require to demonstrate conformance to the government, have that exercise done, and then be available for procurement and use by the US government. Um, that's kind of our internal to government role. We also have an external role in participating in standards bodies. We work very extensively in both national and international standards bodies in a range of areas to include cybersecurity, where the MO for the US government is to use and follow industry and have industry-led, consensus-based, open standards bodies be the default choice of, industry, of, excuse me, of government when government needs to pick, select, or identify a standard. And that's not just you know, good motherhood and apple pie talk. That's law, as in the National Technology Transfer Advancement Act, NTTAA, specifies that. It's also policy from the White House and OMB A119 policy that states this will be the, um, the way the US government looks at, seeks, and, uh, and works with industry in standards and in standards bodies. Um, NIST is a small agency, comparatively. Um, so when we do our work, especially even when we do our work for our internal corporate standards for the US government, we do this in an external and collaborative process because most of the products we will use will come from industry and many of the smarts on how to do this right reside outside of government. So when we have this open, collaborative, transparent process that includes industry, we find that we get then the best product that we can <coughs> use inside the government and something that is potentially realistic for industry to build for us that we need. Yeah. So yeah. if I could follow up, if I could. So the other seat that's not on the other end of this, this panel would be Joe Jarzenbeck and DHS because the four of us as an enterprise actually as work as partners uh, for the federal government to work on the supply chain risk management effort. Uh, we've been working together since the CNCI initiatives uh, on supply chain risk management that have continued to live, even though the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative has now sunsetted. I know Michael Daniel, when he announced the new information sharing um, uh, analysis offices, the ISALs for the critical infrastructure, emphasized that one of the areas we should do a better job of sharing information was our supply chains. So the government and industry has to do a better job of where we find problems or, or find uh, positive um, information about supply chains and best practices. We should be sharing those to develop those commercial standards that we will all use. Uh, a couple of forums that, that we use, so in DOD um, there is the Department of Defense in, uh, Instruction um, 5200.44 on trusted system and networks and I deal on a quarterly basis with all of the agencies and services on what are our best practices on due supply chain risk management for DOD. Uh, partner with NIST um, to lead a, what was working group two on supply chain risk management now is folding under the Committee on National Security Systems and we're actually rewriting uh, CNCS, CNSS Directive 505 on supply chain risk management right now, uh, which is a parallel construct that uh, the wider federal government would use on national security systems. Um, obviously partnered with GSA on the, the publication of their document last year on cybersecurity improvement through acquisition. That was part of the framework initiative. That's paragraph 8 echo under um, Executive Order 13636. 
Um, so we, we partner with these, these four um, groups all the time so we get a more uniform message from the federal government on supply chain risk management. Yeah. And then I would be at a and remiss, Joe would have you know, sort of chastised me if I didn't mention the software and supply chain assurance forums. So on a quarterly basis, we get together normally at MITRE in McLean, uh, three days worth of conferences on software assurance, hardware assurance, supply chain risk management, uh, assured services kind of activities, best practices, usually 200 or so attendees from the public-private domain on what are those best practices. Um, bigger uptake in the last two years when, that we've gone more supply chain than just software and a lot more international uh, participation. Um, so, um, Canada, uh, Canadian government's participating, the UK government's been participating, um, some of the individual companies with a global, more of a global footprint are participating more. Um, very encouraged by that dialogue. And, and uh, you know, Matt mentioned OMB A119. We're very big fans of that at the Open Group because we think it's actually a very good policy on encouraging government use of voluntary consensus standards organizations like the Open Group. And you know, you mentioned you know the NIST initiative and the uh, supply chain assurance and the security and supply chain assurance workshop, which we we try to bring in all of the input developed by members of the open group and, and share those to like, you know, get the, uh, bring them into those government processes as well. So uh, Matt, since you mentioned um, the uh, special publications, 160 and 161, uh, 161, a good, it's actually a good example here, I think, of uh, the government you know, using that open process that you folks have defined to bring in um, voluntary consensus standards from industry. And uh, of course, meant re referencing uh, uh, the Open Trusted Technology Provider Standard is in there. So um, how do you see those uh, playing with the, the cybersecurity framework that's, that's come out of the, uh, uh, the President's initiative? So that's a, that's a great question. So I'm going to try to parse this out uh, as carefully as I can. So the cybersecurity framework was developed under an executive order uh, with the right. intent of it to uh, be for U.S. critical infrastructure, external bodies, uh, non-U.S. government agencies, um, to uh, kind of convene them together to come and uh, self-organize to develop the cybersecurity framework. And um, it's funny because you know, I was listening to the earlier panel with Larry and, and folks, and they, were, they kept calling it the NIST cybersecurity framework. And we always kind of cringe when we hear that. We like to call it industry's cybersecurity <laughs> framework. We just have, you know, we hosted the party. You know, we bought the beer. Um, but they came and they had the party is kind of how we like to look at it. Um, and uh, that's going to be our aspects going forward. It's, it's industry's framework. It was built by industry and it's for industry. Uh, special publication 800-160 and 800-161, actually 161 specifically, was developed in coordination with GSA, DOD, and DHS in the working group that Don was discussing, as well as in this open process where it was put out for public comment and it cited um, appropriate standards as we felt them necessary. But it's really for use internal to government. It's a special publication, so it's for internal government use. That being said, um, we often find um, NIST special publications or DOD CNSS products or DHS uh, reference materials to be quite useful for people outside government. And that's a good thing. Um, so if it is used by people in the framework, that's great. When you look at when we developed the framework, we called out a couple of areas that we said not quite ready for us to say, here's some reference standards, here's uh, some specifics that you could use. And some of the areas we called out were in education and training. Um, one of the other areas we called out was in supply chain assurance. And we did not, at that time, want to um, bias or throw an influence in the commercial markets to one place or another by citing a specific reference to an implementation, a standard, or a best practice at that time. I think as we go forward in the framework in the next probably year and a half, when we bring the band back together to have that party again, it's going to be a question we're going to ask industry. What are you using in your supply chains? What standards do you find effective in mitigating your risks? And then let's include them into the categories, subcategories as needed. So that's, I think, the plan going forward. Don mentioned CNSS and the collaboration there. That's the, the intelligence side of the in-house um, policies. And 
the CNSS work and the NIST work, as he said, they're going to be, you know, different cover pages, but same, same text is the plan going forward. Mm -hmm. And then going forward in 161 as NIST, we'd like to look at um, what are some of the technical, because again, we're in the technology space, things that people can do in supply chain to help them understand their supply chain risks, mitigate them appropriately as they, uh, as they feel, and or communicate that back and forth with their suppliers. And there's lots of very interesting R&D work going on in that space, both in academia, at universities, as well as industry around the country. I want to pull on that thread a little bit. You mentioned some of the, the technical aspects of that. We heard earlier about more the more business-oriented approach of, of assessing risk, you know, forming risk taxonomies, assessing risk, and then getting commercial insurance against that. Um, do you see that moving over from sort of the technical aspects of security into the business practices as well? I don't know if moving over um, might be the right term. What we'd like to, though, see, and we've seen the cybersecurity framework as a mechanism to allow this, is to not allow the translation to be dropped between the technical side and the business side. Um, when we first did the framework, the first month, you know, we're, we're NIST, and so we reverted to our comfort zone, so we wrote something geeky and very long. And um, business came back to us and said, you know, this is very nice, but my CEO is going to throw me out of the door and, and not give me anything. Um, make this something that can translate from management level down to technical level and allow people to understand from business risk and how that integrates to business risk all the way down to the technical things that I need to do. So um, that's a long answer for saying I'm hoping it, we can keep the translation from technical to management, not necessarily replace or, or have to bounce back and forth. So I can just follow up a little bit on the technical aspect. So I think that's a, a, a strong point for the OTTPS, so the Open Trusted Technology Provider Standard, is the fact that I don't know that we're mature enough to test product to know that all the vulnerabilities are pulled out of that product. Okay? So we're not there yet. But we can identify the best practices and say, is a given company or line, a line of business in that company using those best practices? And we can actually have good dialogue with those, those portions of the organization to say, these are the practices we're following, and I gain trust and confidence in those practices, and those practices make sense to me, that, that I can gain trust and confidence in the development of that product. I don't know that we're mature enough to know how to test that product yet in many, in many cases. We do test in some arenas, that's good, so we need to have product testing, but I know that the, the idea of having a process accreditation in some kind, uh, process de designation is of value to us. This should be complimentary, right? Because, yeah. you know, good processes will produce good products. You would think so, yeah. We, <laughs> but then it's trust but verify, right? Yeah. Yes. I got it. So, so you mentioned uh, OTDBS, so uh, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, uh, are there other, uh, we, we started on a, a global theme, and we always try to think not only just of, uh, even though we're in Baltimore, uh, we, we always try to think of beyond the U.S. standards. Are there international standards or international activities, Don, that you'd, you'd highlight as providing impact in the uh, in supply chain security? Yeah, well, so we often lean to the ISO community in, in that arena. I know the ISO, uh, the open group is engaged there as well, as mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, so the development of 27,000 series, 27,001, uh, 02, are, are looking promising to us as they're maturing and are being updated. Uh, those that, that have participated, many of the industry players participated in the development of 27036 on ICT supplier relationships. Uh, that's a free standard, at least part, part one is out there. I think that's a good um, sort of strategic standard that, talk, that talks about how to talk about the supply chain. It's not something you're going to credit against uh, or, or test against. Um, I, I think that when we can have those commercial standards that we reference is w where we're able to raise the bar on those commercial off-the-shelf type products that then allow industry to produce products that are used globally. Um, we may not be able to get the, the high assurance kind of world, like a crypto world. We may not be able to agree those at the, at the global level and may end up seeing national standards in some of those individual niche areas and we have to you know, develop our risk management to work in those arenas. But as much as possible, we, re we prefer to use commercial standards. That's back to the OMB 119 Alpha where we can. Yeah. Yeah, well, I should probably mention here that there is an activity inside the open group to talk about uh, higher level risk assurance or higher levels of assurance um, working you know, at ISO and, right. and common criteria. So we try to cover the whole spectrum there. So those are the, the guidelines we're hearing. I wanted to ask Angela um, if there's been a lot of focus on these guidelines um, for determining who's a, 
a legitimate or trustable reseller or OEM uh, that for the federal government to procure from. Why is it, what are the obstacles? Why is this hard for the federal government to, to go and say, put that kind of evaluation uh, into, uh, into a procurement? Because obviously procurement's going to really drive what a vendor will uh, invest in. Right, so um, I, I think I'll just uh, share um, kind of what, what uh, Don has said. So these, these are my opinions. Um, they largely re reflect you know, a lot of the work I'm doing and, and with my colleagues in government, but they are my opinions. So uh, I, think, um, I think it's a fair statement to say that certainly the government recognizes that purchasing from trusted suppliers and purchasing products and, that we can rely on and have a high degree of confidence in is certainly an objective. Um, there are challenges. Uh, you know, sometimes we wish we had a little magic wand and could make those challenges go away, but, but the reality is we um, uh, do have a balancing act with a, a number of different special interests, and uh, uh, you know, whether it's um, ensuring that there's robust competition, um, the need to ensure that uh, you know, we uh, don't impede innovation, there's, uh, uh, the government has a, um, a, a definite interest in helping to promote small business, we have specific goals we need to achieve, and uh, and just from um, experience, uh, kind of a magic wand approach where everything's uh, everybody must comply with X, uh, often um, creates some political tensions on the Hill where um, you know certain politicians might get phone calls and that creates some other challenges. So uh, all said, um, let me back up a little bit and say back to the executive order that we all worked on quite closely it was clearly identified as one of those core recommendations that we made back to the White House as a, as a consensus group working on this for all of whole government efforts, that that is absolutely the direction we need to be going into. Um, we need to have a way to identify what those uh, tr trusted sellers are and those resellers and those products. And, um, and we're working on that. It, it is a commitment. We're, um, there's active working groups going on right now. So I, I you know, I, um, it's not an easy answer. There's regulations involved and other things like that. So I think just stay tuned. Um, we definitely want, the, want to hear the input from industry on that and continue to have a robust conversation about that. If, if I could follow up on you, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I, I jump please. in a lot. I, I, I think it's better to have dialogue, so yes. if you don't mind. Yeah, I agree. So the OEM issue is huge for us. So aerospace and defense uses products much longer than most other enterprises. So if you look, a lot of the uh, airframes that are out there are used for 50, 60, 70 years, and they're modularly upgraded over time. Same for our weapon systems. Um, our information systems tend to turn a little faster. Um, but still, we face a challenge that many of the parts that we use mm -hmm. are no longer in production. So I, I can't go buy them from the original manufacturer. So how do I develop the best practices to identify some sort of authorized distributor list in some way, shape, or form? So in those niche areas where I can look at a given uh, source of supply where I know it's going to be out, we actually looking lifetime buys. Our, our diminishing manufacturing services program in DOD looks at that and says, where can we buy lifetime buys for those products? You can't normally do that for software. Um, but, but you can you know, gain some supportability contracts in, in that arena. So we try to do that and extend life. But there are often times that we face ourselves um, with, with a challenge of the original manufacturers no longer in business. Mm -hmm. So how do I then establish some trust and confidence uh, for, for some supply chain that was not originally established by the OEM? Um, there are some whitelisting efforts, and uh, we think that, that for narrow bands and narrow niches of enterprises, we actually can do whitelists for that arena. We're very reluctant to do whitelists for broader communities because that narrows where you can source from. We definitely are not in the practice of blacklisting. We often have to caution. Um, a, a lot of the dialogue in this arena comes back to is, why don't you just buy American? And I often come back and say, I don't know what that means That's anymore. Right. Because even if I bought something that was made here in the US, most of that supply chain that supports that manufacturing or assembly is parts that come from around the globe. So it really is about sourcing smartly in a global economy. Um, we are less concerned about something being produced internationally than being touched by a foreign government unduly. So we are about foreign ownership, control, and influence. So where we think a government actually touches the supply chain does cause us concern. So it's not about a company being hosted or based in a foreign country. It's there may be some sort of relationship with a government entity that we're 
Yeah, Larry, yes. And if I could just add on a little bit, and I was kind of remiss in saying that, back to um, the business due diligence information service that we're working to stand up. So recognizing thing that maybe regulation isn't always the right answer, or law isn't always the right answer, how do we move forward on meeting those objectives, on, on finding confidence uh, across the board in our products and services? And so to that extent, it is about what kind of information can, can we look at better from a risk management perspective and make better informed decisions. Um, to the extent, uh, and I think this is where you're going to see the government headed, um, right now our, our level of awareness and uh, over um, the products and services we buy is, is pretty, pretty rudimentary um, in terms of a, an assurance level. Uh, you know, we kind of look at finance, we look at a few financial things, you know, do, does the company have capability to actually do what they're saying they're going to do? We look at, uh, you know, did they do something for Joe over here and, and he didn't like it and to past performance? And then there's some, a few little things like Trade Agreement Act. Beyond that, there's really not a whole heck of a lot. So we clearly recognize the need to look at the supply chain, um, the people, the, the processes, the types of uh, adoption of standards and good practices, um, all those indicators. And, uh, and to the extent we make a risk-informed decision, um, certain things may be weighted differently, perhaps. And uh, so that may be one way we achieve our objective. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that, you know, gets highlighted when we have this discussion is, you know, we use the term supply chain a lot, but it means a lot of different things depending on, you know, we just talked about two very different threat models in supply chain, um, as well as what we're talking about. We're talking about people, we're talking about business relationships, we're talking about product, um, or product mm -hmm. realization and product development. And all of them have supply chain contexts to them, depending on your mission and your threat model that you're, that you're trying to mitigate against. Um, you know, coming back to the OEM or authorized reseller uh, issue, it's a wonderful way to help with, uh, for example, counterfeit, right. um, but mm -hmm. not necessarily business relationship, uh, potentially, uh, long term. That being said, the government, in my opinion, um, but maybe larger than my opinion, needs to do a lot better job in managing its procurement to OEMs and authorized resellers. And on the flip side, we need to get off our unsupported legacy base. So a lot of the supply chain issues we have in the government are self-imposed because potentially we're still sitting on either XP or God help me, the old deck vax in the basement um, running COBOL because it's been running for 20 years and no one wants to turn it off. So a lot of it is our own modernization fears and getting us off of unsupported legacy technology and into space that would help us reduce the supply chain issue. Yeah, Don, I have to uh, pick up on one thing you mentioned, talk about sure. white, white listing. Um, uh, this is something where typically when an open group, when the open group would do a standard, we provide a mechanism by which uh, a vendor can self-identify themselves as being compliant with the standard right. um, and use that as a way of at least input to right. how vendors create their approved vendor lists or their whitelists, whatever you want to call it. Uh, do you see a role? Do you see a role for that? What's, in, what's interesting? Both, I, both in DOD and in the critical infrastructure yeah. stuff. So I, I know that um, it's frustrating sometimes when you help develop a standard, and I, I do get queries, say, well, why don't you just call it on a contract, make it a, make it a government-wide standard and enforce it in all your contracting? Well, we generally don't make those unilateral decisions. We lead up to the risk management aspects of that individual enterprise to call out that standard. Um, however, um, we do recognize the fact that we need to have better contracting mechanisms that give credit where someone's making the additional efforts to improve cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. I know that my leadership and CIO has challenged us in that, in that space. My, my job's changed a little bit uh, to be broader than supply chain risk management in the fact that, that we're looking at the, for those that know DOD, that's sort of what, what we call the mother of all charts that shows all the acquisition processes across DOD. How do we better include cybersecurity decision making in all of those acquisition decisions? How do we partner better with the procurement and acquisition community to influence those? And part of the challenge for us in the space is how do I give credit where someone is improving the cybersecurity aspects of their products? So we, we want to get away from that least cost technically acceptable solution to give extra credit in the source selection where someone is doing something more. So how do I do that? And I would say that if you've got a given standard you know provides you more trust and confidence, 
I gain a certain level of trust and confidence if someone self-certifies against it. I gain another level of confidence if there's a third party look at that kind of world. So how do I give that, that credit to those companies that are doing that additional due diligence? And so we're investigating how to do that better. Good, good. Well, for Matt, Angela, any? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so about five years ago, I used to get a call once a week from a company that said, uh, I have a proposal or I have a contract and it says I have to do the FISMA. You know, what, is, what does that mean? And uh, we say, oh, okay, take a deep breath. This is going to be a long stand. And, you know, we usually turn them back to the contract and say, ask them exactly what their requirements are. Um, that conversation is dying away, which is a good sign, in my opinion. I think communication between government, it starts with the system owners to their contracting shop, and then from the contracting shop back out to the vendors. I think that flow is going much better just on the reduction of those questions that I'm getting. Uh, the, um, when we looked at the, again, at the cybersecurity framework, it was about integrating cybersecurity risk with all the other business risks, with economic risk, with customer mm -hmm. risk, with supply risk. Um, so when we look at this in an acquisition aspect, it would be nice if cybersecurity was a factor that was looked at along with price, along with past performance, along with you know, all the other things that are looked at in a contractual review or a bid review. So it should be something that's integrated with that. So now I'm going to go to another thing about self-certification. Um, so the government does allow for vendor self-attestation, and there are standards on how to do vendor self-attestation that you conform to a standard. Um, and the government has a range of programs that allow this. Um, the um, products that meet uh, IPv6 government profile implementation, um, the government just says, here's our IPv6 profile. You go, you test, send us your test results in mm -hmm. with your product, and you self-attest. That's good enough for our risk tolerances in using products that we believe meet IPv6. And then we have a range of test programs from vendor can self-test, vendor needs to get an independent mm -hmm. test, mm -hmm. vendor has to have a third-party test, pre-market, all the way through post-market surveillance, and it has to do with where your risk tolerances are. Pacemakers, we like to have pre-market, third-party independent testing, and then post-market surveillance and how they're doing in the products. High impact issue when they fail. Right. Um, IPv6, lower risk, okay, Vent, here's our requirements, vendor you self-attest to us when you come back. Um, nothing stops industry from voluntarily self-attesting to a standard as part of their communication back to the government as far as how we manage and control our risk to you, government. Comment? Yeah, one, one other piece. I'm glad you mentioned FISMA, because as we talk about cybersecurity, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm seeing- I'm sorry I mentioned FISMA, I guess. No, no, I'm, I'm glad. Um, it's kind of been my own little personal pet peeve for a long time. Um, I've had the opportunity to have to sign off on um, uh, accreditations and authorizations for systems, and it's uh, it's about how do we raise the conversation up and out of the CIO organization to actually the the business and mission leaders. We're talking about government, um, and it gets back to moving to a risk management based type of an organization, not a control compliance checklist. Mm -hmm. But really, how do we understand that in the context of our mission and our responsibility um, you know, in delivering that mission, uh, you know, what is it we're trying to do and what's that impact um, if we do it poorly, if there's cyber threats or, you know, or cyber issues that we, we experience there? And, uh, and within that context, looking at what those products and services need to be and how much vetting needs to occur and what level of assurance we need to have over that this product just like you were saying with the testing programs so i, I think um i think we're very pleased we're seeing that shift occur you know certainly from some of us not happening as rapidly as we'd like but it needs to happen thoughtfully um and uh steadily and i and i do feel positive um that we're moving in the right direction now just a couple more questions I want to get in. I want to make sure we leave some time for uh, audience questions here. Um, and, but I'm going to kick this one, start with Matt. Um, we've talked a, little, a lot about how government does procurement, and of course that's, that's a big lever. Mm -hmm. But the, the cybersecurity framework also talks about critical infrastructure, which are largely or almost universally in the U.S. managed by um, uh, commercial, commercial companies. Uh, so how do you see these kinds of policies and 
processes and metrics moving from the, the federal procurement world out to these uh, commercial companies in the infrastructure space. So I'll turn to DHS. Oh, there's no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, as we were talking earlier, the the framework, uh, which is one piece of the larger executive order for which you know we all participated in. Uh, Department of Homeland Security is running um, a voluntary program to help uh, commercial uh, critical infrastructure owners and operators implement cybersecurity programs, uh, enhance an existing program, communicate their needs uh, to suppliers or requirements. Um, but from a market perspective, we've also seen the cybersecurity framework being used as a standardized mechanism to express their sec security requirements. So. Uh, critical infrastructure owner operator, a small, you know, local electric co-op or a water muni, um, they're focused on delivery of their core service mission. That's what they're very good at. And they'll outsource a lot of their other things. They'll outsource their HR, they outsource their payroll, they outsource their IT. And along with outsourcing their IT, they'll also outsource their cybersecurity with their IT. So their outsource provider will just come back to them and say, this is what we do. And they say, well, I guess that looks good. Um, but they didn't necessarily have a standardized way to compare one provider to another or to clearly articulate what they think their requirements are to their services or their suppliers. So as a communication mechanism, we're seeing markets starting to form around, this is what I need from you, service provider. And reflectively, service providers saying, this is what I can give you, you know, critical infrastructure owner operator. Um, so that's at a service level. We're also starting to see product mapping capabilities that they're offering as well. Uh, Don was talking about you know slow turns and some right. DoD products. Um, critical. Some of the large critical infrastructure things are you know very long term infrastructures. Yeah, you know you'll keep a bulk power generator forever uh, because they're very expensive. They take you know x amount of years to build. Usually they're custom builds, um, and as long as it's working you're going to keep turning those, those turbines. So uh, much longer turn in some of those infrastructure products as well. So we're seeing the framework being used to express either capabilities or requirements between suppliers, products, and uh, infrastructure owners and operators. Mm -hmm. Angela, any, any thoughts? Uh, I, I, um, uh, just one other piece that um, I, I I think that the government is now doing a better job and there's much more outreach occurring. Um, there is, I know if DHS were here, they would talk about some of that, that uh, in the past there really haven't been those formalized structures where we and the government might know something bad is happening or there's an issue or a concern or something with a product or whatever the case may be. And we didn't have those mechanisms in place to actually share and have a conversation about that in a, in a forum that was safe and um, and informative and uh, kind of could figure out together how we needed to proceed. That's happening now. I think uh, that's going to continue. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it is a challenging space. I mean, you've got everything from, like you said, outsourcing it to you've got, got embedded, you know, uh, firmware type issue. It is, it's very complicated. I will say that um, I think for just GSA, we're kind of looking at that space and figuring out like, hey, you know, we haven't really thought about operational technology and GSA has a kind of lot of that um, that we're going to need to start considering. I, you know, I mentioned the fleet. We have the buildings and smart metering. and So there, there's definitely applicability to us. We also have a kind of a government um, continuity, a government role as well. So we play in the space. I couldn't say we're, we have a large footprint, but there's um, it's definitely important. Thank you. So, um, so Don, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the global nature of supply chains. You don't know, you don't know what made in the USA means. So I'm going to ask maybe what is the last and perhaps the toughest question I can ask to a government panel, and that is that um, you know, supply chains are global. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good that governments you know, help protect their citizens by raising the bar on security. But from a vendor perspective, there's a lot of concern about how do we navigate what are potentially lots of conflicting or overlapping yeah. su supply chain security or general cybersecurity or policies and regulations, because all of those things you take time and cost money to put into the products. So how do you see 
how do you see these um, us moving from these initiatives of specific governments up to use of uh, more you know, global yeah. standards? So we started pursuing the 27036 initiative in the ISO world. Um, when we said we need a, a standard to start looking at supply chain, we had a, a couple of blank stares and you know, saying, well, what do you, we, have, we have standards out there to do supply chain already. And we started talking about um, what's the demand signal? So how, how do you group the demand signal in such a way that the commercial entity can answer that demand signal? Because if you all parse it differently as a nation, all the nations parse it differently, then you can't accommodate that from a, from a COTS product perspective. So where can we gain some common expectation? Maybe there's some common expectation in critical infrastructure and there's certain levels of assurance you expect in certain practices for those types of products. Um, if we could agree those kinds of areas where we have common demand signal, then it would be easier for industry to answer that. I would tell you one of the tough ones I, I see today is cryptography. I think, I think it's going to be really tough to have you know, global sourcing standards on cryptography. You may have a low bar, but it's fairly realistic. Some of the national standards of cryptography may be really unique, and that makes some sense to us at this point in time. Um, there are other places where we can agree um, a, a, a demand signal um, that will help us answer, I, I think the, the term we use often is a fit for use determination. So I see a COTS product. How do I make the fit for use determination that COTS product answers my demand signal? I think that's something we have to do as users. But, the, but if I can group better with a common user community and send that demand signal to the industry, they can then reduce costs and answer that in a more efficient manner. And that's target. the way I'd like to go. The standards create targets for Exactly. Now, I would comment, and um, um, one last comment from me, um, one of the first initiatives I worked on uh, with Joe Jarzenbeck, with um, John Boyens, Emil was not on the team yet at that point in time. In 2009 and 2010, we were invited to the White House to start working commercial standards on cybersecurity. And we wrote a white paper um, that was very well received. Nothing happened with that white paper. Uh, last fall, NIST was tasked to reinvestigate that initiative. And we're right now at an interagency working group level reinvestigating the government's role in cybersecurity standards. And so that is evolving very quick. And I would not be surprised that in the not too near, to near future, maybe August, September, you'll see something published in that arena for public comment. Great. Looking forward to that. Angela. So I, I think you know I think the area of standards is so critical when you are talking global, um, and and I think you know to the extent that I think all of us in this room understand it, you know, standards can be extensible. They can be tailored so that when you need to get to the next level of granularity or specificity, you know, that that can happen um, for specific you know needs. Um, but by and large, yeah, we, we we cannot separate anymore that we we are all you know part of the earth if you will and all have to work together and our products are you know are sold and we have you know um, economic interest and in, and in being good partners trade partners so uh, I, I think I, I'm glad like John said that um, there's now a, a reinvigoration of the uh, recognition that we need to look at our standards and how we're adopting them and, and how we're applying them and where they're applicable uh, uh, I can tell you from um, just kind of this one is my personal opinion. It's, it's been a challenge. I, I'm a huge proponent of of standards and tried working in that space. It's difficult having that conversation at a business level with our executive management is it, because it is such a long term effort. There isn't that immediate political win. I'm like, okay, you know, what is this going to get for me tomorrow? It, it's really a long conversation. So. Uh, you know, I think um, we're challenged, and we, uh, you know, how do we communicate that? How do we make that emphasis um, it, it, in the context of the the business value? I, I think we'd all be well served um, from that perspective. So, uh, you know, at at NIST, this is a almost a daily conversation. Um, so, some of the realities are the U.S. government is not the big procurement gorilla that we used to be, or mm -hmm. maybe we are, but other big gorillas are entering the game as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is appropriate. So long term, we have to think very hard and careful strategically about choices we force on industry and where we may make them make a choice 
that might be non-tenable to the U.S. government. So we have to be very careful strategically about our requests and requirements on requirements to, to commercial industry for commercial products. Um, that being said, um, international standards are the best place to hammer these things out, where industry participates in an even footing with government. Um, and being a non-regulatory agency under the Department of Commerce, it's usually um, infrequent when another country pops up with a countrywide specific and unique requirement that multiple folks from industry do not kick our door open and say, are you guys aware of what country X is trying to do right now? Um, mm -hmm. So industry is both our best ears on the ground as to what's happening in the individual countries um, as well as the best advocate for interoperable, understandable, industry participative processes in those standards. Right. That's actually one of the things we would we tend to focus on here as well. So it's it's good to hear that you're listening. What's that? You know, we're <laughs> born with two two ears and one one tongue. So glad to hear that. So um, want to wind up the this question phase, but I'm sure we've got some from the audience. Jim, do we have uh, have some questions for the panel? We have something like 15 questions, so oh. apologies in advance, because I'm sure we're not getting to all of them before lunch. Um, so first question, where do you see IT supply chain threats and risks in the broader context of all cybersecurity threats and risks? Are they increasing in importance or as a concern? So we, we wrestle with this one all the time. So all of us are in this world of, of wrestling with cyber breaches on a daily basis. So. We spend more and more of our time responding to activities we see ongoing today and yesterday. Um, I have to go back from a leader awareness uh, perspective all the time and say, we have to do these things. We have to respond. But if you ever want to get in front of that response curve, you're going to have to buy products smarter than you buy them today. Because we actually don't do it well, and we should do it a lot better. We're very enamored with cost and schedule. I want it cheap, and I want it now. And I often trade off the long-term costs and security requirements to get it cheaper now. And that means I have to spend more time doing the response stuff. So I spend a lot of time on the awareness side to make leaders aware of that, that you have to spend some time investing you know, to buy from trusted sources up front. Doesn't mean you're not going to have to do response activities, but hopefully you'll do less of them. Yeah, and, and let me add on a little bit. So. One, I, I absolutely think there's a broad awareness that this is you know, not going away, it's evolving, and, and you know, we got to get, like Don said, got to get ahead of it and not just be completely reactive and responsive. Um, but when we talk, you know, we don't, we don't build by and large our own things and, you know, anymore. Maybe we didn't years and years ago. Uh, so we procure. So how do we do that? But it's not just, okay, we know we have to do it smarter. It's not us just coming up and saying, oh, this is what you need to look at. It's, it's broad. It's, it's about changing the behemoth government. So we've got acquisition professionals who have to get certification and go through little check boxes. So how do we introduce them um, into their responsibilities and gain their, you know, raise their awareness? Uh, the requiring officials, it's, it's across the entire spectrum of um, how, we, how we manage uh, kind of our back-end processes, if you will, and um, be, you know, like I said before, getting out of just the CIO organization and making it more of a holistic look. Yeah, so, uh, so yes, I think it's good that we're looking at supply chain now. Um, I think it shows a higher level of sophistication of how we're trying to manage risk. Um, I think it's also an element of uh, us pushing threats around um, and pushing them into places where uh, they can have uh, lower cost for them and higher return. Um, so we're kind of pushing them into these, these spaces as well. Um, but long term, I go back to, you know, a, a, another one of those supply chain means lots of many different things. Um, if we just build these things better, which is a supply chain issue, um, then we'd have a lot of them downstream immediate issues taken care of. Jim, another? Uh, so next question, the OTTPS has been submitted to ISO for consideration as a PAS standard on uh, the final ballot ends in the next couple of weeks. What impact would you expect the adoption of that uh, by ISO to have in the U.S.? I'll tell you a standards joke. Uh, nice thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. Uh, so uh, it's not necessarily uh, where it is, but the usage. So that's, 
That's the, that will be the key issue. If industry finds this useful and industry starts implementing it and reflecting it back to its customers, government being one of those customers, that's where I think then impact will occur. That was actually one of the first comments made uh, when we started this new interagency working group on the standards effort was we're starting to develop a list of all the standards that are available to us and one of the criteria we says, well, having a list is of real value, but what part of industry is actually using that standard and how are they using it? We need to have a better you know, capture of that information. That's really important, the usage and adoption. And, and I'll just kind of, you know, hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, I mentioned our um, business diligence information service that we're working on standing up. One of the things we've been doing very consciously is having conversations with as many people and organizations, entities as we possibly can and getting that feedback back. So, you know, we're trying to move away from a thou shalt to a how do we all do this together and do it in the most you know intelligent way. So we're looking at you know industry has their own supply chains. What are, what is industry doing? Um, how do we make sure what government's doing is going to align with what what your practices and needs are? Uh, I, you know the insurance industry is a remarkable parallel to some of the things we're having to look at. Um, so so there is a conscious effort on on looking at this holistically and, and aligning as much as we possibly can. So, we sneak one more in? Uh, it, it's a hot potato question, so probably a good one to end on. Uh, okay. we're <laughs> probably <laughs> done. <laughs> a few questions on the OPM breach, and uh, you know, one is what did not work well, another one was you know, what, what role do your organizations have in helping agencies to get their security right? So, I'll just throw that out. So, I'm, so I'm not um, an official spokesperson on any of the OPM breach information. Um, I, I, I would say that I think that there is, um, there was a comment I think on the Dan Reddy and Larry Clinton panel about this is not a tech issue. And I know that when we started a new initiative under Terry Halverson, the CIO on what was called cyber, um, this is, I'm, I'm not dodging the question, I'm trying to answer it in a, in a politically correct way. Um, we have good technologies to do lots of things. We have good policies. We don't always follow them. And so we have an initiative getting ready to roll out of DOD on cyber hygiene or cyber discipline that looks a lot like the four things that were these are best practices. How are we doing those and how well are we doing them? And, and if we grade our own enterprises that we're actually following the, the, the policies we've established, we'll clean up lots of the problems of the breaches we're seeing today. Because, because a lot of them are due to the fact that we have bothered our own process. Our process. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. So uh, we don't have a response uh, or a forensic responsibility. That's with, uh, with DHS and FBI. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, we write the corporate policies for how to implement a cybersecurity program. Um, whether or not they're followed is a different issue. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got my, I got my letter. You got your letter? Ooh, I got my letter. Angela? I got my letter, too. I think twice. <laughs> so. I didn't get a letter. <laughs> <laughs> I sure Don said this, yeah. Right. <laughs> I think we've gone over a, a, a little bit, so I'm standing between people and their lunch. So I want to uh, thank my panelists, Don, Angela, Matt. Thank you very much for some great information.